This is this is a course in knot theory. And my name is Lewis Kaufman. And I'm affiliated with NSU and with the University of Illinois at Chicago. And my email address is this. And you do not need to take notes, at least not really, um, because I'm going to be recording what I do in the course in a notebook like this, and then I will create uh, a PDF file at the end of each session of the course and um, put it in a Dropbox where it can be um, uh, made available to anyone who's taking the course. Or if it's small enough, I might send it in the email if I have your emails. Um, but I will make uh, an email to uh, to you or send Nikolai an email indicating how to get to the Dropbox. I, I should have done that before class today, but I didn't think to do it. Um, let me see what else I want to say. Uh, there are quite a lot of people here, so... I'm not going to ask you to each introduce yourselves um, today, uh, but rather I have asked each of you in the chat line, and I'll put it here as well. Please send an email telling your interests. And in that way you at least interest you at least uh, um, tell me about your interests and I may feed back and tell the whole group something about your interests. Um, what are my assumptions here? My assumption is uh, uh, small background. Now some of you may have a long-standing large background in doing work in topology, but I will assume a small background. So small background means that I will assume uh, a bit of abstract algebra, and hmm, basic point set topology. So I'm not assuming that you know homology theory or the fundamental group or any of those things. And we'll start there and build quite a lot of knot theory as we go along. Um, I'm very open to your asking me questions while I'm talking if you wish to do so. So uh, if, you, if you wish to do so, just break open your microphone and say something, ask a question, uh, make a comment, uh, whatever you like. And, um, if it, and that should be very useful to us, useful to me uh, to hear what you're thinking about. So um, what I will begin with is uh, some talking about knot projections and the Reitermeister moves. So I'm going to save this slide and go on to another one.
Okay. So, um, a knot is an embedding of a circle. S1 into R3 or S3. Um, we might say a not representative because sometimes we speak of knots in terms of the equivalence relation of them under some notion of moving them around, but a specific knot. Um, is often referred to as a specific embedding like that. And um, of course, R3 is, is equal to three, three space. Um, you can think of it coordinate wise as X, Y, Z, such that X, Y, and Z belong to the real numbers. And R is equal to the real numbers. And S3 is equal to the three sphere. Which we could think of as X, Y, Z, W, such that X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared plus W squared equals one, the unit length vectors in R4. So S3 is contained in R4, like that. And uh, these are basic ideas which are worth thinking about. We'll come back to uh, the question of how you visualize the three sphere and talk about three manifolds eventually. Um, but what we have here is that R3, we can think of R3 as um, sitting inside of, uh, of S3 if we wish, or we can think of S3 as projecting by a stereographic projection to R3. S3, topologically, I'll explain what I mean in a moment, but S3 topologically is homeomorphic to the one point compactification of R3. That is, you add one point to R3 and you get S3. And um, this is stereographic projection. And as long as I am talking about it, I will draw a picture of it. I won't do the full formalism of that, but I will draw a picture for the sake of completeness of what I'm saying. But you add one point uh, to, uh, to R3 and you get S3. So let's use another board. And let me go back one to the real line and the circle. And the circle projects by stereographic projection to the line. Um, and you'll now see what I mean by that because it isn't actually the circle that's projecting by stereographic projection. We have to remove one point. So here's the line, and here is the circle, and here is the North Pole. All right, and if I take a point on the circle, and I have the circle here 
sitting inside of the plane. The circle here in this picture is contained in the plane. And the real line here is also contained in the plane. Here. So I have a circle not centered at the origin, but centered uh, just tangent to the zero in the real line. And I have a point here on the circle. And I draw a straight line from the North Pole through that point and get a point on the real line. And that is the stereographic projection of that point. So the stereographic projection takes the circle minus this north pole to the real line. And this is a homeomorphism, which I will abbreviate like that, homeomorphism. All right, that's the stereographic projection. Um, and so you can think of a circle as a real line with one extra point added to it topologically. And we can say what that means in terms of the topology as well, but I won't bother you with that. I just want that image to be available. And you see you can do the same thing one dimension up. You can have a two-dimensional sphere and a plane. thus tangent to the plane. A two-sphere. And a plane. And an origin here. And a north pole here. And a point here on the two sphere and a straight line going through that point and going straight down and ending up on the plane like that. And this will be the stereographic projection from this time, the stereographic projection from S2 minus its north pole to the plane. And so as you see, we have this relationship of spheres and Euclidean spaces for all dimensions in exactly the same way. So that we have the stereographic projection taking homeomorphically uh, an n-dimensional sphere to an n-dimensional Euclidean space if you remove one point from the sphere. Um, and for the sake of knot theory, it's often useful from the point of view of symmetry to think of the knots as being in a three sphere rather than in a plane. So let's go back to the knots now. Oh, one moment. Mm -hmm. So I may I may imagine uh, a circle embedded in R3, let's say, okay? Um, and I may make a drawing like this to indicate how it's embedded. And I'm, I'm making a kind of three-dimensional looking drawing. We, can, we could uh, uh, do that if we wanted to. Just, just to indicate to you that I'm, I'm thinking of it actually three-dimensionally like this. But of course, my drawings are all in the plane after all, but, um, but still, here's this circle, which is embedded in, in space. And in this case, forming, forming a non-trivial knot, in this case. And I've drawn a tube around it just to make it look a little more three-dimensional for us. But then, um, you can think of a plane in R3, a choice of plane, a projection plane, and we can project 
in the direction of the projection plane and end up with a picture that looks like this, a shadow, down in the projection plane. And the shadow is a one-dimensional curve drawn in the projection plane which is crossing itself, as you see, because of the fact that the knot goes twice in some cases. But I, uh, I also will indicate in the projection the... Let me show you what I'm indicating. If you've seen this before, of course you've seen this before because it's a drawing convention, even if you never studied knot theory. But the idea here is that the, bro the unbroken line should be, oh, I did it exactly opposite. That doesn't help us very much. Let's fix it. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. So, um, I wish to draw this in such a way that this part here, which projects to this part here, being farther away from the projection plane will be solid. And the one that's nearer to the projection plane will be broken. So this goes over. It's higher. The higher one is unbroken. Then it goes under, as you see, and so this one's the higher one. And then we come around here, and this one's higher. And so this is the shadow diagram. of the knot. So here's our knot. And here's a shadow diagram of the knot containing a little more information than just what you would get by projecting it into the plane. In fact, enough information to allow you to reweave the knot if you wanted to. The distances between things are quite different here, but the basic relationships are the same. And, and so we will deal with knot diagrams. And knot diagrams are, are a ubiquitous, useful language for working with knots because we can give all the basic information about constructing the embedding by using the diagram. So here's a, a diagram of a trefoil knot. Here's a diagram of a figure eight knot. Question? Was there a question? I heard a buzz or some sound. No. All right. So this this is the trefoil knot, and this is the figure eight knot. I do hear uh, some background noise. I do hear uh, some background noise. <laughs> Uh, I think I have to ask you to mute your microphones unless you're going to ask a question because otherwise we get some feedback like we just did. So please mute your microphones. So, so here we have here we have a picture of uh, of uh, of the beginning of of mo of what we want to do. We're going to think about the knots in three-dimensional space, but we are going to project them into the plane and work with diagrams of them rather than the embeddings themselves. Um, and of course, up here in three-dimensional space, there's a lot of room to do various things to the knots. So let me give you an example, a, a live example of doing something in three-dimensional space. I have here some metallic rope, and this is unknotted. And I can move it around in three-dimensional space. So, for example, I can twist it like that. And you can well imagine the diagram that you would get as a result because you're looking at the projection. And I can make it more complicated. I could twist it like this as well, right? And it's starting to look knotted. Um, and um, I could take this part and twist it around like this, like that. And, um, and by now I have... Um, 
I have um, made a relatively complicated looking object embedded in three dimensional space. A much more complicated embedding of a circle in three dimensional space than the one I started with. But this one, this one is nevertheless unknotted. We know, uh, but by unknotted I mean that I can continuously, without tearing it or changing it, deform it until it becomes a standard circle. And you know I can do that because, after all, that's where I got it from, right? So, um, so let me try putting a little information of that kind on this slide as well. Two knots are, isoto are ambient isotopic. If there is a continuous family, two knots alpha taking the circle into R3 and beta taking the circle into R3, our ambient isotopic. If there's a continuous family, uh, gamma S, S belonging to the interval 0, 1, of knots. So each gamma S takes the circle and R3, such that an embedding, right, not means it's an embedding, and a, and a continuously varying family such that gamma 0 is alpha and gamma 1 is beta. And uh, I'm going to assume for our purposes the embeddings are differentiable. or simply finite piecewise linear. But I'm going to give you a model that's very specific in a moment for three-dimensional ambient isotopy. So you don't have to worry about that. But, uh, but the reason I'm, I'm making this restriction is because we want to think about a model that corresponds to what, what actually happens in practice. So for example, if I make a, let me give you another example of an isotopy. I'm going to tie a knot in this rope. And if I just pull on the rope, that's undergoing an isotopy to a, a different embedding. And if I were to, um, if I were to, uh, let me see if I got the one I wanted here. Nope. There you go. No. That will do. I can, of course, with a rope, I can make various examples of knots. Um, uh, it's not a circle. 
um, but I'm doing uh, ambient isotopy to it without worrying about the ends, so you can think of the ends as far away or spliced together like that. But in any case, I have this guy. This guy is a non-trivial knot, and I could make him a little more complicated, and, and then I could make him even a little more complicated. And the reason I'm showing you this one was because Ambient isotopies are actually really very physical things, and, and if I just put forces on this one, uh, you will be watching a very nice ambient isotopy of this knot to the unknot. You will, I claim. I have to help it along a little bit. You see, it looks knotted, but it isn't right there. And it goes away, right? So ambient isotopies are something that you could think about physically, and that's an interesting topic that one could get to. But we, what we do not want to do is, we, what, one thing that we do not want is to get rid of something by making it ever smaller. Until it just completely disappears. I don't want that, all right? So in order, in order to avoid that, since I said it was a continuous family, I could assume that each one of these is differentiable and 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 had a non-vanishing tangent vector and then this would not happen so i can avoid it that way another way to avoid it is to simply not allow infinitesimal things to happen and those are the two ways in which i tend to think about ambient isotopy but let's continue now uh how shall i continue i better save this Do I hear a question? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm, I'm preparing to go to the next slide, but I can handle your question without that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so this uh, making things small procedure, uh, can it be used to unknot non-trivial knots? Is that why we are uh, avoiding it? It's not minima that I'm avoiding, but vanishing tangent vector. Yeah, yeah no, uh, this procedure of making things very small, uh, can it be used to unknot non-trivial knots? Can what procedure? This procedure? Yeah. No, no, no. You, you would still, even if you went to the purely continuous situation, you would still have knotting. Uh, so then why exactly are we trying to avoid this? Because I want to compare with what happens with finite diagrams and it's better not to allow this. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you you'll, you'll see in a moment because I'm going to give you... Oop, what happened here? Uh, there we go. That's our reference line. All right. So... So... Uh, Reitermeister Alexander and Briggs used the fa used used and we will used piecewise linear, I'll write PL, piecewise linear, ambient isotopy,
And this is a good way to think about knots in three-dimensional space in these terms in relation to diagrams. What, they, what that means is the following. The knots are made out of straight lines. Something like that. Now you have to be careful when you draw pictures of this kind because you, you may draw pictures that are made of straight lines in the plane, but they will not necessarily realize to straight lines in space. I may have, I may have committed such a, such a sin even here, but perhaps not. Perhaps that really, but you should imagine, made of straight lines in space, all right? Um, and then the move that uh, the basic move that, uh, that they allow is the following, that you have an edge in your piecewise linear knot, and you have a point outside, and you consider the triangle made by that point and the, and the edge on the knot. So you have an edge and a point, and you get a triangle. And this triangle must not, by the triangle I mean the, the two-dimensional triangle, must not intersect the knot. except at E, the edge that you started with, which is in the knot, all right? Under those circumstances, you are allowed to replace the edge by the other two edges of the triangle. And that, we'll call that the triangle move. All right? That's what you're allowed to do. And that's all you're allowed to do. But we'll see what the consequences of that are. But, in fact, let's take an example and see what we might be able to do with it. Um, for example, in this example, obviously I could, if I wanted to uh, do that, I've done an ambient isotopy, um, uh, I could do some other things uh, that are um, more interesting if I look, let me see. Um, Mm -hmm. Suppose that, um, let's use a color. Suppose that I have this point here. And let's suppose that that point is below the plane. So this, this arc here and this arc here are not, are, these are not touching uh, the knot at all because this is below and that's below or farther away from you. Okay? Right? Yeah, under those circumstances, you would be allowed to put this edge in and that one in and remove that one, right? So actually, you can do a lot when you start to think about this. You realize that there are many, many things that you can do to the knot because you, you just choose a point and push an edge along that point or take two. You, of course, you can go in either direction. You could, um, you could have these two edges and um, and uh, this edge, and you could remove these two and put that edge in, still with the stipulation that the triangle doesn't intersect the knot. Is that clear? That we have this very nice, basic, one-move, three-dimensional method of moving the knot around in space. And we will say, we will consider, um, we, so we can consider 
um, K equivalent PL to K prime means a sequence of triangle moves taking K to K prime. All right. And you see that you can imagine triangle moves in pictures as well. And in fact, it's exactly that that is going to give rise to a pictorial way of thinking about knots that are projected into the plane. So let's keep this slide and go on and make another example. Let's take, let's take an example here of an unknot. Now I'm going to draw a piecewise linear unknot. Right? And, and it's quite clear how to unknot it, isn't it? Right? Uh, all you have to do is see that triangle there, and then this will be exchanged for this. And now you might say, well, I would love, what about, uh, what if I really wanted to turn it into a square or a rectangle? What about uh, shifting it down to this point? How would I do that? In other words, what if I wanted to subdivide an edge? Well, let me show you what to do. I'm, I would like to, I want to move it down to here, but what I'm going to do first is I'm going to go right over there and I'm going to put a point there. All right. And now I have a triangle. Oop. I have a triangle like this, a very thin triangle. Right? Like that. Yeah? And I'm allowed, I'm allowed to replace, uh, that point means this point, sorry, I'm not drawing very well, but um, I'm allowed to replace this point with this point. And I have this triangle here. Um, but what I want to do is get a point back here. But now you see, I could choose a point here. This point is not on the knot. And I have two triangles now. And I can do this in two steps. So what I did was I took this edge. I stepped away from it. Now I have these two edges. Now I take this point in here and I have a little triangle here and now I'm going to go, you'll see in the end what I'm doing if it isn't clear already. Oh, excuse me. I see what might have confused you. But I'll do it again anyway. I moved this away. Then I did the move to here. Now I choose this point and move it halfway back to here. And there's still a point here. And there is this triangle, and I now move it on that triangle. And I end up back here, and I have a new point. So I think I need to do this in the abstract for you so you really see what it was that I did. Excuse me a moment. 
Ah. Mm, there's a little bit of dirt on the... All right. So what I'm saying is this. Let me do it again. I have an arbitrary edge in my in one of my knots. And I wish to go from here to here, subdividing that edge, putting one more vertex into the edge. It's useful to be able to subdivide. It should be the same knot. How do I do that? And the answer is, I do that as follows. I choose a point just off the edge. And I do the triangle move that gets me to here. Then I choose a point back where I'm looking for a point, that point. And I do two triangle moves to get back to there, one of them over here. And then the other one over there. And I end up going from from an edge that has no subdivision to an edge that has a subdivision. All right. And once I had the edge with the subdivision, then of course I could contract that other guy and get myself over to a more rectangular bit. So I hope you're beginning to see uh, that I really have a lot of leeway to do a lot of moves on these things. Um, let's um, save that. So, we have the following question then. What do the projections of the triangle moves amount to. Right? And we can start drawing some examples to see. So, for example, you might have the following situation. Two edges that are near one another. And you decide to do a triangle move. by putting a point over there. I'm just drawing the intermediate. So you see that that looks like what you may have already understood to be a Rademeister 2 move. In other words, you can see that there is behind this a generalization of a certain kind of move on diagrams that would be like this, a diagram move that would allow you to do something like that. And this is happening in this way. So I'm just doing some examples now, but, but then we will get a theorem out of it in the end. But. That's one. Uh, let me show you another one.
or in fact, let's think about um, let's think about some examples because you see here's a triangle. And then you can say, all right, um, here's a triangle, and and how uh, how does the diagram look with regard to the triangle? Uh, it might look like this. Just nothing else there. Here's the triangle, and then this goes by the triangle move. Um, this well, mm, mm, sorry, if we had that triangle. Then this would correspond to, um, sorry, this would correspond to going from here to here. And it's just a simple extension or pushing around of the line, not too interesting. Um, on the other hand, there are other examples of things that could happen here. For example, we might have that um, that the lines of the knot were going underneath the triangle like that. Right? And then this would still be a legitimate triangle move. And then what would it look like? Then it would look like this, that you started in this position and you ended up in quite a different looking position. All right. So you might, if you're hoping for very simple moves, which would have to do with the way the lines were arranged in regard to the triangle, then, the, then you might imagine that this is going to have to be one of your moves. But we'll see that this, is, this while it, it looks complicated, can be accomplished by some other moves. So we won't take it as a fundamental move, but it's one of the fundamental things that could happen. What's another fundamental thing that could happen? Well, you could have the triangle uh, and you could have one edge which is like this, but the other edge would go underneath the triangle like that. And you would be exchanging between this and these two, right? So in this case, the, move, the place where you started would be like this, and the place where you ended up would be like this. And that one I'm going to draw a general diagram move for because it is one of the general diagram moves that we're going to use. It's this. You have a little curl and it can be replaced by no curl at all, like that. Now, uh, have we, let me see, have we considered all possibilities so far? We have. We, we have two edges that are not involved with the triangle in the projection. We have the case where one edge is involved with the triangle in the projection, or both edges are involved with the triangle in the projection. So these are all, the, all those cases. Uh, on the other hand, what we have not considered um, in considering very elementary things is things like this. Here's the triangle. Here are the edges outside, and here is a bit of uh, a bit of knot diagram which is going underneath it from somewhere else, right? And then what does this do? Well, this we, I think we drew this already. This is an example of what I called Reitermeister 2 move, you see, because in the before situation, it looks like this. And in the after situation, it looks like this. And so and so this one corresponds to our second Reitermeister move pattern, right? That's with one line in the diagram going through here. And you may have more than one line going through the diagram going through here. You could have a lot more lines, but it's quite possible to have one more line, and we should look at that case, but I have to go to the next slide. Right. 
Okay, so now I'm thinking about the following case. Here's my triangle. Here are a couple of lines uh, going in and out of the triangle that are not crossing through here. And then there's a bit of extra stuff happening in the knot diagram that isn't involved with the triangle. And one of it is like this, and another of it is like that. And the reason I'm isolating on that, as you can imagine, and no matter how small I made that triangle, there still would be this crossing happening inside it. It's a generic case. So we can consider what this looks like, right? Um, and then there's more than one case of this. So there are a number of cases to consider. I'm, I'm not going to actually go through all possible cases, but... Um, Give, oops, I, that's not the way I'm doing this. I'm showing you the whole thing and then the two sides of it. All right. So what are the two sides? The two sides of this guy are this and that. That's with this in. And then the other side looks like that. And we have this, and we have this. Like that. Now, the classical third Reitemeister move is one of the examples of this. And let's go to it and then see how it would work in terms of an example from the piecewise linear situation. The classical third Reitemeister move, the one that is the one people usually use, is this one. And how would that figure as a triangle move? Well, you can see immediately how that would figure as a triangle move. You might have a situation like this, And then the other end of the triangle is down here. And now I drew this part over, but that doesn't matter. It's just not intersecting the triangle. But here's my triangle. And this is another example of triangle with lines going through it, right? Triangle with lines going through it. And in this case, it corresponds exactly to the classical third Reitemeister move. Here is a relative of the classical third Reitemeister move, but it's a little bit different. And so you see there are a lot of moves. Um, and what am I going to do about this in order to tame this situation? Well, here's, here's the story. I have enough room to tell the story on this slide a little bit. Okay. Um, one key point is that we can subdivide any triangle as much as we like. After all, you could imagine a big, fairly big triangle with lots and lots and lots of knot diagram going through it, never intersecting it, but in the projection, lots of knot diagram happening there, all sorts of complicated stuff going on. But you are allowed to put points in the middle of the edges of the triangle. And then you can think of smaller triangles as a result. So your big triangle can be thought of as this subdivided triangle, if you like. And then if you were going to make the move by, that goes from here to here, you can make the move by first going to here, and then to here, and then over there, and finally up to the top. Let me, I'm probably not being clear about that, so let's consider subdivision for a moment.
Let's suppose that you had a triangle move that you wanted to do that went from here to here, but you were interested in subdividing it. So you decide that you're going to take your triangle and subdivide it like that. And my aim is to get from my aim is to get from here to here. But I can by using the subdivided triangle go from here to here and then we still have this triangle so I can then go um, I can go here and then I can go here and then finally I can go all the way up you see so if you subdivide the triangle you can go through a bunch of smaller triangle moves to get from the beginning part to the end part now what does that mean that means that if your triangle had um, and, and of course you can subdivide again you can subdivide as many times as you like so you might subdivide a triangle and then subdivide it again um, and and make smaller and smaller triangles as a result choose your poison for how you care to subdivide them but you can make them small as you like and a a very small triangle may contain one extra line as in like that I mean, no matter how I subdivide this, somebody's going to contain an extra line um, or a cross line or a crossing. Like that. No matter how small I make my triangles, uh, I still may have a crossing. So, so the work, the smallest ones the smallest ones have one line or one crossing or edge lines. And I remind you about edge lines. Remember, you could have edge lines like this. That could that could be the extra line. You could have edge lines. So this this is a not bad finite enumeration. And if you enumerate all the cases and write down all of the different things that can happen, of which I've written a few, it's not too much more than that, you find that The end result the end result is that in the projections
all moves can be accomplished via little empty deformations of the line, little curl replacements, what we called Reitermeister 2 and what we called Reitermeister 3. With, of course, variations in, in the crossing uh, structures uh, for each of these cases. You could, for example, switch that crossing and still be a move and so on. But those are the basic moves. And what you will see if you go through the enumeration that I started is that some of them are exactly these, and the other strange looking ones are able to be done by these. And just for fun, let's go backwards if we can and look at one of the ones that we had before and see that we can do it by this method. I'll just do one. Um, let me go to the next board. So let's, let's go back to one that we had before. We had, uh, maybe we had this one. That was one of the stranger looking ones, right? That, that's, that's a minimal triangle. It's got crossing lines. They happen to be edge lines. Um, and and um, this means that you would start here And you're going to end up all the way over here. And we don't want to make that one of our elementary moves. So, so the problem is, do get, get from here to here by Reitermeister moves. Ah, uh, but you see, you can. Like, for example, I can go here by a Reitermeister 2 move, by the 2 move, excuse me, I'm writing them in the Roman numerals. By the 2 move, I can go from here to here. And then by a, a 1 move, I can go to a, a bare line. And then by another 1 move, I can go over here. So, of course, this seems silly, but, um, but it is an ambient isotopy that gets me from here to here that only uses one and two in this case, you see? And so this is the way it goes, and you find that um, you, find that you have proved the theorem of Reitermeister and Alexander and Briggs theorem, Reitermeister, Alexander, and Briggs, that two diagrams, D and D prime, represent ambient isotopic knots if and only if D is obtained from D prime by moves 0, 1, 2, and 3. Okay, that's the theorem. We've sketched the proof. I suggest that you go back over my notes about the sketch of the proof and Try to write out the cases and see that you can actually write down all the cases for the least triangles and that everything I said is true. Um, it's good for you to try writing this out. 
This is the basic theorem that allows us to use knot diagrams. Let me give you an example to look at. I'll give you an easy example first. I would like you to unknot this using Reitermeister moves. And I have to go away from my desk for two minutes, so um, this gives you a two minute break and you can try getting Reitermeister moves to undo this knot. I'll be right back. I'm back. Did anyone, did you manage to undo it using Reitermeister moves? Yes. I'll take your word for it, but um, you will notice, uh, so then you notice some interesting things about this diagram if that's the case, right? Because um, there aren't any moves without doing a third move. Mm -hmm. There aren't any two moves or one moves. I point out mm -hmm. to you that this um, to this loop here, you look at this loop and you think I'll just remove it. But it's the loop. 
but you, uh, this is a Rennemeister one move. You have and, to pull it out from over the other one. Right. I, I just wish to point out to maybe you understand, but not everyone does, that if you had this situation, yeah. then this is certainly equivalent to this, but this is not a one move. Mm -hmm. All right. That when I when I indicated the moves like this, like this, and like that, I meant them in the strictest possible way. That's because it's useful for theory to have them strict. So that means that you have to have a three-sided empty region here. You have to have a two-sided empty region there, and you have to have a one-sided empty region there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so while this looks like a one move, it's not available. So, so we look at this diagram, and there aren't any simplifying one moves or simplifying two moves available. So you have to do a three move, and then it will work. And you can do a three move. So just for the sake of whoever is listening to this and maybe didn't think what to do, I'll draw the arc that I have in mind uh, that I would like to use. So this red arc, this arc here can be moved by a three move over to this one. I can do a three move that would take me from here to here. And that, of course, could be the triangle. You can see that triangle there. There's the triangle, and it's a triangle move, in fact, right? So you're allowed to do that. And if you do that, if you do that, then you're ending up in this situation. Oops. And I'll just draw these back in red, don't matter. And we have this diagram. So the original diagram is equivalent to this diagram by a three move. But now you see a two move. And after you do this two move, you see another two move. Mm -hmm. And you see a two move over here, and it's all falling apart. But it needed a three move in order to get started. And I, I mean, if you had undone it, you, will, you found that to happen. Yep. Other comments about the problem? Then I'll give you another problem. More interesting one. Much more interesting. Um, let me see. Did I make that too complicated? Let me see. Maybe I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, sorry. Let me start again. That's what I wanted.
There you go. You can keep looking at that while I make a copy of it. Okay, now, what about this guy? Knotted or unknotted? Looks knotted. Kind of looks knotted, but it isn't. Hmm. Now, suppose you were trying to unknot it by simplifying it. You look for moves that would simplify it. Um, but when you find something, you don't find any, you don't find any of these that would simplify. Um, and uh, you don't find any of these either. What you do find are some of these. But that doesn't simplify. That's a little bit of weaving. Well, you see that here, 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 over there. Um, and um, you're you're hoping to find a third Reitermeister move mm -hmm. like that, but you in fact find some interesting woven things that are certainly beautiful to look at, a little woven triangle like that, right? But uh, that also doesn't move. You can't do anything to that. Uh, looks a little like a third Reitermeister move, but there's nothing you can do. So there aren't any, no simplifying moves. But it's unknotted. It is unknotted. Uh, I want to show you why it's unknotted. Uh, let me um, change color. And let me look at, examine this arc here, from here to here. Mm -hmm. And it goes entirely underneath, right? So I could, I could, uh, I could swing it. I could do a triangle move, in fact. I'll just draw the result of my triangle move. Uh, uh, the big result of my triangle move. More, a little more than a triangle move. But you see, I could do a triangle move that would take me all the way out like that. Maybe two triangle moves, but I could get this arc to slide all the way underneath the diagram until it was way out here, right? It's clear that I could do that. I can make that happen by a continuous deformation of the curve in space. You might see what you could do with large triangle moves to make it work rather than my little Reitermeister moves. There's an exercise for you. What's the least, smallest number of moves by triangle moves to get from here to here, right? But it does go from here to here. These are, these are ambient isotopic. I'm saying ambient isotopic, right? Ambient isotopic. So, so these are ambient isotopic, and and now uh, look at what you have, and you see this goes over, and this goes over. So if you now look at the black arc from that point of view, it is an arc which crosses over this and then crosses right back over it. That's a two move all the way along in there, from there to there a great big two move. So this will pull in. And once it pulls in, it pulls in again and it gets unknotted. So it is unknotted. Um, it's unknotted, but there's no simplifying moves. You have to make the diagram more complicated where complexity is the number of crossings. Before it simplifies.
Now that's a very interesting phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that has to do with the Reinemeister move. Um, later, we will see Gienikov's moves. And I'm not writing what I'm saying. That Gienikov's moves turn out to allow you to simplify unknots, but they're a different move set, not these. Different way of looking at it. Right moves are limited. Um, if you if you have an unknot, it may not be unknotable by right moves without making the diagram more complicated. In this case, we can make the diagram just a little more complicated. Uh, let me do it on the next slide. So I hope everybody is clear that this is indeed unknotted, that you can swing this arc out and then pull it in and it'll go away. Um, but how much more complicated do we need to make the diagram in order to simplify it? So let's make another copy of the diagram and, and uh, work with it a little bit. So I did a two move. Made it more complicated. Two more crossings, right? That's all I did. I just pushed a two move in. And now it's much freer. Take a look at it. Try doing some things in your head. Of course, it's very hard to do these in your head. It's like trying to look ahead in a in a complex chess position. Um, but here's a three move, right? It's available now. Three moves don't change the complexity. Um, two moves can reduce or add complexity. One moves can reduce or add complexity. And three moves, when you do them, do not change the complexity. So when I talk about simplifying it, sometimes I may not change the complexity. But simplifying means doesn't make more complicated. Here I made it a little more complicated, and now I claim I can simplify. This three move is available to me, and if I do it, well, let's do it. Let's just have fun. I'll do the three move. That would take us over here, right? Okay, now what am I trying to do? I'm taking, trying to take this arc, this arc, and swing it all the way over to the right. So now that, that's my aim, but I, I can see what I want to do. Here's another three move that became available to me right now, and I'll just do it. Let's just keep on doodling for a little while. So I do this three move. Like that, right? And then this arc goes away. Yeah. Oh, but there's a two move. So I can um, I can get rid of that. And connect this to this. No, am I stuck or can I keep my oh look a triangle move. I can go up here. Life is getting good. I did my triangle mode. 
Oh, now I, now I have a one move. I can do that move. Now I can just get rid of that thing. Mm-hmm. All right. Now what? Oh, here's a two move. I can pull this all the way out. Like that. Okay, all right. So I accomplished my aim. I got the arc swung all the way out. And then this, this great big thing in here is a two move. I can bring it in like that. I'll just keep on going for a moment and clean up a little bit. So we got to here, um, and and I'll stop. You can just look at it. You see, there's another two move that pulls it in, and then it goes away. It just all falls apart. So it turned out that all we had to do was make it just a little bit larger, and then it fell apart. But here's the problem that we don't know the answer to. The problem is. How much complexity is needed? Complexity increase is needed. If you start with an unknot diagram and you you know you have to make it more complicated in order to unknot it. How much more complicated do you need to make it? Later, I could give you a bound, but it's not a very good bound. And we don't really know the answer to this problem. So even at the very beginning of this theory, there are very interesting combinatorial research questions like that. Um, we're nearing the end of our time. Let's summarize where we are. So we have the problem of ambient isotopy of knots. in R3 or S3. And this turns out to be the same as diagram Reitermeister equivalence of knot diagrams in the plane. Uh, I was a little loose about certain things. My knot diagrams are always um, four valent plane graphs with extra structure. Every node is a four valent node with extra structure. So if you see a node, it might look like this or it might look like that, right? And that came from, from the idea of projection and we have an equivalence relation now defined on these graphs with these kinds of nodes by using the right of moves. And 
and diagram equivalence is going from one to another by Reitermeister moves. And this is the Reitermeister Alexander Briggs theorem that tells us that this big topological problem of classifying knots in three dimensional space turns out to be the same as a comp problem about graphs formulated the way we have problem we have formulated it. And this doesn't solve the problem. It just gives us another arena in which to work on the problem, but it turns out to be a very fruitful arena to use the diagrams and the moves. Um, what I for another thing that I forgot to say that's worth mentioning at the end here is we can study links the same way. I talked about single component knots just for the sake of drawing single component knots, but you can also study links like this, right, where this is multi-component. And a link up in the three space picture is a disjoint union of circles embedded into three space. So you can have many circles. And each, the circles can link around one another and they themselves can be knotted. Um, and there are many interesting problems that have to do with links as well as with knots. And we study them all in the same form. And the Reitermeister theorem applies. And the next, um, one more slide. Next, we want to uh, look at invariance of knots and links. And so I'll just tell you what I'm going to talk about next time. I'm going to talk about linking number. And linking number, if you haven't seen it before, is a kind of an intuitive idea. If you're looking at these two, for example, and you oriented them, then you would say that this one goes around this one once. And how do you count that? What kind of counting gets you the linking number? It's something like a winding number. There's the linking number. There is the fundamental group. and a generalization of the fundamental group, which we call the quandle. And there is, in the order in which I will tell you about it, the Alexander polynomial. And maybe somewhere in between these two, there is some interesting lore about coloring the diagrams. And and then we will talk about the um, Jones polynomial and so-called Kaufman bracket. So I don't claim I'm going to talk about all those invariants next time, but that's where I'm going with the invariants. And and then when we get to the Jones polynomial and the bracket, we will slow down and spend some time seeing what we can prove with those invariants. And we will generalize to what I call virtual knot theory fairly soon um, because it's really very similar in its formal structure to the Reitermeister move theory that we just outlined. So. Um, 
let me give you one more example to think about, uh, and then I'll quit. Here's a favorite link of mine. I call it W. This is called the Whitehead link. And as you see, the linking number of this is zero, even though you haven't seen the definition of linking number. You see that this goes up through that, that loop, up through this one, and then it goes right back down through it. So whatever you're counting, to count how many times it goes around this, it doesn't go around it. It doesn't go around it at all. And yet it is linked. There's no way to get those two apart. And so you might try to understand how does it happen that this link is linked? You can make one. How does it happen that it's actually linked up even though there's no total circulation of either component around the other? It adds up to nothing, and yet it's linked. How does that happen? How do you prove that such a thing is linked? And for that matter, here's the knot that we've been looking at all evening, and the claim is that this is actually knotted. And that has to be proved by showing that there is no sequence of Reitermeister moves. Doesn't exist. No sequence of Reitermeister moves from here to here. We have to prove things like that if we're going to start doing mathematics with these objects. So, as you see, we're some, because of the formulation we're taking, we're somewhere in between graph theory and knot theory, and combinatorics and topology, and we can walk in different directions and find out what the terrain is like, and that's what we're going to do. I'll stop there. Thank you.